Welcome to our worship this morning again here at West Kelvin Baptist Church. Uh, may God uh, be glorified and honoured in all that we do, uh, in the words that we uh, sing together, uh, as we listen to God's word, as we think uh, about uh, the truth that God speaks to us uh, in his word. Uh, we have a guest speaker with us this morning. He's not with us physically, um, but, but is joining with us. Uh, our brother Luke, who, who some will know, uh, spent a few years with us uh, a number of years ago while he was studying here in London. Let me read a few verses from, uh, or let me read Psalm 123, um, the whole uh, psalm. I lift up my eyes to you, to you whose throne is in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt. We have endured much ridicule from the proud, much contempt from the arrogant. Amen. Uh, well, let's uh, sing together our first song this morning. Let's sing. Yeah. 
We'll be reading a little later from God's word. Uh, uh, Brother Luke will be reading uh, to us. Um, but we're now going to come to prayer. Let's be especially in prayer uh, in these days for the uh, family of our uh, sister Dorcas, uh, who went to be with the Lord uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, let's pray that the Lord would comfort and strengthen, uphold and bless uh, them and, and all uh, who, who will miss her. Uh, and will grieve and mourn for her passing. Uh, but we remember uh, that she is with the Lord. Uh, she is uh, seeing, she has seen her Lord, uh, beheld his beauty face to face. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you uh, that you are a gracious God, uh, that you are uh, the God who has loved us with a wonderful, a perfect, an everlasting love. Our Father, we thank you that you uh, reach down to us from heaven with your goodness, uh, with your kindness, your graciousness, your gentleness. Our Heavenly Father, we worship you that uh, in the face uh, of, of the sin, the brokenness and the corruption that is in the world, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ has come, uh, has lived uh, amongst us here uh, in this world has borne all our weaknesses and struggles uh, and has taken and borne our sin there upon the cross, though he is himself without sin, perfect in innocence. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for him, that he is the Lord, the giver of life, the one who has overcome death. Uh, we worship and praise you, our Heavenly Father, that in him we find and, and receive perfect forgiveness of, of all our sins, washed away. Uh, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us as we look to him today to, uh, to remember that fullness of grace. When we are uh, downcast or discouraged, please lift us up and remind us uh, of the Lord Jesus in all his glory. Please remind us, our Heavenly Father, of all your good and perfect purposes for us. So, Father, help us uh, day by day to walk with you. We do uh, pray, our Heavenly Father, for um, the, the family of, of our sister Dorcas. Uh, we pray, our Heavenly Father, for, 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 uh, for all, that you would draw near to and comfort them, that you would bless them from on high. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for the great example of faith and joy and kindness that she uh, has been over many years to so many people. Uh, we pray, our Heavenly Father, that as we think about her example, we might learn from that ourselves to better uh, reflect that love and kindness of Jesus. Our Father, we commit uh, into your hands, especially those who will be making uh, all the practical arrangements. And we, uh, our, our Father, we do pray for those who, uh, who, whose hearts are torn by grief. Uh, we ask that you would help them as they work through that, that you would uh, draw them uh, afresh to the foot of the cross to see uh, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for, for, for any who are grieving, who do not know you, may they come to taste that perfect comfort that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Our Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves as a church, as a congregation, that you would build us up and bless us, that you would draw near to us and lead us. Our Heavenly Father, for the church uh, leaders, that you would give wisdom and help to them as uh, they plan and work and labour. Uh, we pray, our Heavenly Father, for, for all in the congregation who are, um, who are struggling to press on and to keep going in these days of, of difficulty and isolation. Father, that you would uh, make known your glorious presence to all, that all would, would, would look up afresh and see uh, you in your glory. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, pray for all the, the, the families and the children who are uh, these past few days and in, in the, the days and weeks to come receiving exam results, Lord, that you would, you would help them and, and, and enable them to, uh, to take those next steps that they need to take in their studies, in their lives and in the career, their careers. Father, that you would open uh, the right doors for them as they uh, step forward, that you would provide for them in every way. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are disappointed uh, with their results, that you would uh, help them to see that you are sovereign and in control. And Father, if, if it is of you and if it is, if it is the, the right thing, that you would enable them to, uh, to go through those processes, to have those perhaps upgraded. And Father, for, uh, for all, our prayer is especially uh, that they might know Jesus as their saviour. Our Heavenly Father, we, uh, we confess that it is easy to be taken up with the, uh, the responsibilities and lives that you lay before us in this world to the extent of, uh, of forgetting your glory and your grace. Oh, Father, forgive us when we do that. Uh, we pray that in all our family life, in all our work, and especially in our studies, uh, that you would help us to keep that heavenly perspective, uh, to keep our eyes fixed upon you, above all else. And so, our Father, we pray that for the young people of the church. Lord, we long for them to come to Christ as Saviour. We long, our Father, for those who, who have trusted in him and are yours, that you would establish them in grace, that they might grow up in Christ. We pray, Father, for, for the young people who are yours, that, for, for, for they would um, step out and, and, and declare that faith in the waters of baptism. Uh, and Father, uh, our prayer for them is that you will be with them in the days and the months and the years to come, blessing them in every way in their lives, leading and guiding them uh, as they seek to serve you. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, pray for, uh, for our country. Uh, Lord, we, we continue to pray that you would uh, bring us out of this, this time of, uh, of isolation and, and difficulty and trouble. Our, our Heavenly Father, we pray uh, for those who are seeking uh, to prepare medical treatments or vaccines. We, we, we commit those things into your hands. Our Father, we don't know the ins and outs and rights and wrongs, but we, uh, we pray that you would provide our Heavenly Father according to your great and glorious purposes. Our Father, we uh, pray that you would uh, be with uh, governments around the world, our Father, at the, in these difficult times. We pray, our Father, for the people of, uh, of Belarus. Lord, we long for, for um, freedom uh, in every country. We pray for freedom in that country, Lord. Um, uh, again, we, we do not know your purposes. We cannot see into the hearts of men. But uh, if there is uh, corruption and, and, and dictatorial rule in that country, we pray that you would deliver the people from that and uh, bring to them a measure of freedom. But we pray that especially for your people and for the church. Lord, that there might be freedom for all, that, uh, that your people might uh, worship freely, might serve you freely, might proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, freely. We pray, Father, build your church in that country. Our Father, for, for, for Luke and Heidi, that you would speak to us through his word this morning. Father, for them as a family, that you would bless and encourage them. Uh, our Father, that uh, you would make known to them your goodness in all its fullness. Our Father, we do uh, worship and and praise you for for this story of grace that we sang about earlier in the meeting 
Uh, we uh, praise you, our Heavenly Father, that our Lord Jesus Christ, he set his, his love upon us. He came forth born of a virgin, entering into the world uh, out of such a perfect heavenly and divine love, according to your glorious purposes. We, we, we worship you, our Father, for that, for that chorus that we sang, uh, that in living he, he has loved us. That in dying there on the cross, he has saved us. That uh, as he is buried, he has carried our sin far away. That he, as he rose from the dead, he freely justifies forever. And we worship you, our Father, for that great and amazing promise uh, that he is coming again. Uh, and Lord, we wait and, and live our lives in expectation of that day. Please give us uh, the confidence uh, and the joy to look to him in his coming, to be ready for him in his coming. Our Heavenly Father, we, uh, we remember the, the, the anguish and sufferings of the cross. Uh, we remember our Father, the physical sufferings, but, but, but the depths of the spiritual sufferings as he received in himself the penalty for our sin as your wrath was poured out upon him there upon the cross. Uh, as he cried out those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we, we know our Father, it was because of our sin that he might save and forgive us. Our heavenly Father, he was he was taken down from the cross and and laid and buried uh, in that garden, uh, and yet he rose again, victorious over death. Oh, how glorious that day! How glorious that day of resurrection that holds within itself uh, the promise of of spiritual re resurrection for for us all as we come to and believe in Jesus. For as we have died with him there upon the cross, as, uh, as our sins have been nailed to the cross, so uh, through his rising from the dead, we are raised with him to live in newness of life. So lead and guide us, we pray, and help us. Fill us with your spirit that we might indeed live day by day to, for your glory. And so our heavenly Father, prepare us for that coming of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, come, we pray. Come on the clouds of heaven. Come and take us to be with you forever. Come and we pray and bring in that newness and perfection of that eternal state when your glory will shine over all things and we will be with you forever. So bless us, we pray. Encourage our hearts. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's sing together a uh, 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 song uh, as a church we know well. Take us uh, to the river. Let's sing.
to everyone at West Kilburn. We were supposed to be with you this this very Sunday, um, and it's a real shame that we can't be there. Um, we were, it was one of the one things this this year that we were really kind of certain of. A, and there's a lot of uncertainty in our lives at the moment. We were fairly certain that we were going to have a home assignment and uh, come and visit the churches. And then the Lord had other plans with coronavirus and so on. Um, so it's um, a real shame not to be able to be with you, but we're, I'm so pleased to be able to um, be with you in this way, virtually, and to share God's word with you. It was two years ago that we were last back in the UK, and uh, we visited West Kilburn, and uh, as we went around, I um, you know, went around the different churches, I had two sermons, basically, that I took everywhere, one of which I preached, I think, five or six times, which I think is a, a perfectly fine thing to do as long as it still kind of moves you, and it, it was a sermon that, that um, moved me, and I was enjoying preaching. And so I'm not going to apologise today for doing something similar in that I'm preaching, I'm going to share with you what I, I shared last, um, just this last Sunday at my church here, um, but this time in Turkish. So I'm doing something different from what I normally do, as in I'm preaching at first in Turkish and then translating into English. Um, so I, I want to share um, with you from... Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. I'll read it now. Um, Mark 15. Um, I could read the whole chapter, but I'm, I want to read a, a significant chunk. Um, but it will be just from uh, verse 16 through to verse 41. Mark 15. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and of Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other w women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Amen. We thank God for his word. There's so much that you could say from this passage. Um, and I'm not going to attempt to cover it in detail. I, I want to look at one thing from uh, this section of God's word. One aspect, and that is Jesus' loneliness on the cross. This is something that Mark's gospel particularly highlights. As we know, there's many difference between, differences between the, the, the four gospel accounts. And um, sometimes when we think about those differences, they can be a headache for us. We can think of them as a problem. Um, unbelievers can sometimes use them to attack the Bible and say, look at these discrepancies. Um, but we really shouldn't see them as problems. Um, certainly there's a, a, the occasional bit which is a bit of a head-scratcher in terms of working out how it all fits together. But really the, these differences are, are due to the different um, outlook, the different angle which each gospel writer has. And they, when we compare them and see those differences, we see what is added or, or what is present in one and what is missed out in another. Those can actually be very helpful clues to us as to what the, the writer is really focusing on and what they um, um, want us to see. And as we'll, we'll see in in Mark's gospel, that that he really wants us to see Jesus' aloneness on the cross, just how abandoned he was. You can see that at least in in these three ways. First of all, there are no friendly faces in in Jesus' uh, field of view in this whole chapter. After um, the denial. Of, of Peter earlier on from from all the way through chapter 15 you do not see a, a mention of uh, of anyone who is a friend of Jesus anyone showing kindness to Jesus at all um, you can contrast that with some of the other gospels for example if you look at um, John chapter 19 and verse 25 you, you see you see see this written um, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to her woman here is your son and to the disciple here is your mother from that time on this disciple took a into his home. So we, we can see that, that John and Jesus' mother were there, were present at the cross, at least for some moments there, close enough to be spoken to. Or you could look at um, Luke chapter 23 and verse um, 27, uh, a little bit earlier as Jesus approaches the cross. It says, A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. So there we find mention of other other followers of Jesus who are um, present as he's approaching the cross, as he's being crucified. But um, here in Mark's account, you don't find that. The first mention of such people um, is in verse 40. Some women were watching from a distance, it says. And this is, they're mentioned after Jesus has died, after he's breathed his last. The, the picture that um, Mark is, is showing us is just as, as if Jesus sees no friendly faces at all for the, the whole time he's on the cross. Mark wants us to see how alone Jesus was, how few friends there were anywhere near Jesus. Of course, um, what's written in Luke and John are not wrong. Those things are true, those things really happened. 
But Mark wants us to see the the loneliness of Jesus as as he looks out um, on this crowd. We can then see it, secondly, um, in the words that are spoken as Jesus is, is hanging there on the cross. In this whole section, there are no kind or believing words from anyone around Jesus. There are many words throughout this chapter. Um, you've got the soldiers Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him. You've got, um, again, the same kind of accusation written against him. The written notice of the charge read against him read, The King of the Jews. Um, uh, and it uh, goes on throughout, throughout the chapter. Verse 29, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. All the words that he hears. There's so, so many words filling Jesus' ear. And in Mark's gospel, they are all insulting. They're all attacks. They're all mocking. Contrast that with some of the other gospels, some of the words we've um, already read. Or, or from um, Luke 23, verse uh, 39 to 41. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So you have a man protecting Jesus. Words of kindness, words of faith. He believes in Jesus and he shows his faith. But there's none of that in Mark's gospel. We only, only hear this. Those who crucified, those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. There's one statement of faith in, in Mark chapter 15. It's from the, the centurion. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. But it's after Jesus has died. Jesus dies without hearing those words. Jesus on the cross, although there may have been one or two kind words, one or two words coming from faith, as the other gospel writers account, he is surrounded by hating, mocking, faithless words. And we can imagine just how painful that that was for the Lord Jesus. We, well, we can't imagine it, but we can we can try. Because what was Jesus' message throughout all his ministry? Believe, believe the gospel. Repent and believe the the kingdom of God. God is at hand. Believe the good news. And without faith, no one is saved. This is. Everything that Jesus' message is based on is that people will believe in him, that they will trust in him and what he's doing. And as he hangs there on, on the cross, in his last moments, he, despite so many people that he has healed, that he has helped, that he's taught, what does he see? What does he hear all around him? Hating, unbelieving words. We can, we can imagine how Satan was using that to attack him. It's all for nothing. You've given your life for nothing. No one believes in you. It was all for nothing. And the, use the words of, 
Isaiah 49 verse 4. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Surely there was a huge temptation for Jesus to think that, to despair utterly as he's surrounded by hate and unbelief. How alone, how deserted and abandoned he must have felt. But the worst was yet to come. Verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? In another place in, in, uh, it's in John's Gospel, Jesus says, He who sent me has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. But here Jesus does not have a sense of that. He, he has this awful sense that God has abandoned him. Not only all of his, the, the people he's preached to and healed and helped, not only his closest disciple, but God himself has now abandoned him. And he hangs utterly forsaken and deserted on the cross. His words, of course, are from um, Psalm 22. Um, he quotes the first line. I'll read that line and a few more. I think to help us to understand something of what the Lord Jesus was going through. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. His words are written to help us begin to understand something of what Jesus was going through something of his loneliness on the cross. So three ways we see uh, Jesus' loneliness. The, the absence of friendly faces, the, the absence of kind or believing words, and then finally being forsaken by God himself. But I want to ask this question now. Why do we have this, that perspective here in, in Mark's Gospel? Why is that a particular emphasis? Well, I think uh, the answer lies in understanding that Mark's Gospel really came from Peter. Now, there's various evidence for that, um, the kind of ancient traditions around it and internal evidence, I think, from Mark's Gospel. Mark went around with, with Peter as his translator, and he would have heard Peter preaching the gospel over and over and over. He would have memorized it and then he wrote it down for us. And, and so we have Peter's account really here. Peter's perspective on the cross. And what had Peter done? Well, just a few hours earlier, he had, he had abandoned the Lord Jesus, hadn't he? He had insisted so strongly, even if I have to die with you, I will never forsake you. But then just like all the rest in the garden, when Jesus is arrested, Peter flees. And then later on, three times, he, he, said, he insists, I don't know that man. I don't know him. 
uh, this, that's an account that um, you find most clearly portrayed in Mark's gospel. Matthew is very similar, uh, but but Peter didn't wasn't trying to hide that. He 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 clearly he some of the, the the information there must have come from Peter himself about how he had denied Jesus. He hadn't didn't try and deny that at all, and. And that's why Peter knew the reason why Jesus died in loneliness, in deep darkness and isolation. What was the reason? Well, it was that Peter wasn't there. Peter wasn't there. Peter had abandoned him. We do, we do find an account of John near the cross, at least at some point. There's no evidence that Peter was there. Peter had abandoned him. And he knew the reason why Jesus died in utter loneliness. It was because Peter had abandoned him. This was the hour when, when Jesus really needed Peter. And he wasn't there. He'd abandoned him. He denied him. Peter knew he had caused Jesus' pain. He had caused Jesus pain on the cross. What, why was, where did this anguish come from? From where did this deep sorrow, to use the words of a hymn, from, from Peter? From Peter abandoning his friend and his saviour. I think that's got to be the reason why we have this angle in Mark's gospel. But what about for us then? What, what is the application for us? Well, I've got um, four things to say briefly. First of all, let's see the Lord Jesus' love. Let's see his love. Because Jesus went to this cross willingly for us. He knew what he was going in for. He, what, it was no surprise to him. The, the agony of every kind that he was going to suffer, he knew it. And he went there willingly for us. Uh, what an act of love. Secondly, let's get comfort from, from Christ's experience of loneliness itself. This is a man who knows suffering. He was a man of sorrows. I wonder if you've experienced loneliness in your life. Jesus knew it to a depth that we will never understand. On, on the human level and on that divine level as well. He knows loneliness. He knows what you have suffered. And dying in this way has enabled him to be a, a perfect and, and wonderful high priest to, to everyone who goes through suffering. He, he knows. He knows your suffering. Thirdly, we, we need to see that our sin caused Christ's sufferings. Of course, we, we didn't cause his pain in exactly the same way that, that Peter did in, um, in that personal way. But in a very real way, our sin caused Christ's suffering. Where, where did his pains and agony come from? Not from his own sin, because he had none. It came from our, ours. It came from the fact that he was paying our debt, it came from our sin in a, in a very personal way. That just in a very close way to, to how Peter's sin caused uh, Christ's suffering. The words of the hymn, and many hymns um, talk about this and put it in different ways. I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. It, it was my sin. Not just Peter's, it was my sin. If you want to understand what sin is like and what it does, and even what, what its effect is on, on God, if we can say that, we see it at the cross. We see just how awful sin is in the way that Christ was left so friendless and um, 
abandoned on that cross. If we're tempted to think lightly of sin, we need to think about these things and realize it is our sin that caused his pain. And fourthly and lastly, uh, we mustn't stop there. We mustn't stop at that point. We need to see here in this chapter the greatness of grace. As that um, him I just quoted put it, I will glory in my Redeemer. This is not a reason for us to, to be miserable for the rest of our lives. This is a reason to glory. Or as a, another him put it, the sinless son of God must die in sadness. The sinful child of man may live in gladness. That says because of the cross, because of the grace that is poured out of the cross, we don't live for the rest of our lives in guilt of what we've done, but rather we live in gladness and joy. To me, this is most, uh, perhaps most beautifully expressed in, in something that happens after the resurrection, um, where the angel, so the women go to the tomb, and there they see an angel who has a message for them from uh, the risen Lord Jesus. Let's read it first of all in in Matthew's gospel. So uh, this is Matthew twenty six and verse seven. Sorry, Matthew 28, verse 7. We'll start from verse 5. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know what you are looking for. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go and tell, go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. Now let's have a look at the same thing in, in Mark's Gospel. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 7. This is the message of, of verse 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And you hear those extra words coming from Mark's angle, that is Peter's angle. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. Yes, Peter, you are included. I still count you as one of my disciples. In my hour of greatest need, you betrayed me. But it is forgiven. The very worst thing you did to me is forgiven at the cross. Yes, you denied me. You abandoned me. But I will never, ever abandon you. My grace is greater than your sin. That, that is what we find at the cross. Unbelievable unfathomable grace from the heart of the Lord Jesus who, who forgives the very worst that we can do against him. We find forgiveness at the cross. I wonder if you think you've committed an unforgivable sin. Maybe as an unbeliever you, you think, can I be forgiven? I've done such terrible things. His grace is greater. Maybe as a believer you think, I've, I, I've become a Christian, but then I've be betrayed my Lord in such an awful way. There is forgiveness for that sin at the cross. You cannot, you cannot sin in a way which is beyond Christ's grace. His grace is greater. It's deeper than our deepest sin. You need to believe this. You need to believe this wonderful good news. You need to accept his forgiveness and rejoice in it. The sinless son of God must die in sadness. The sinful child of man may live in gladness.
I pray that that would be our testimony and our experience. Amen. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Amen. <laughs>